السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I usually start with praising Allah and offering salutation to the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام in Arabic, which gives a little of a strange feeling to the audience because they think that this Sheikh is from Saudi Arabia, he's going to be in Arabic again. But I usually seek Allah's blessing through saying it in Arabic because when you say the Prophet's name, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and you say it in English, it doesn't have this beautiful feeling of offering salutation to the Prophet Even the translation of peace and blessing, it should have been peace and praise of Allah be upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But never mind. I apologize for being a bit late, but we were caught in traffic, and uh, you know London more than I do. I was requested to talk about the traps of Satan, of Shaitan. And the funny thing is that we all, almost all of us know the traps of Shaitan. We all know everything about him in terms of knowledge, in terms of evidence in terms of theoretical information. But when it comes to practice, we're the most ignorant people on earth, unfortunately. I'll give you an example. If someone was ill and he went to the physician and the doctor told him that he should refrain from certain types of food, he should go on a diet, otherwise he's going to deteriorate. And he should avoid this, this, this and this. And the man memorized it by heart. He said, okay, I'm not going to have any of these food. And he was instructed to take certain types of medication, and he memorized it by heart. But he neither took the medication, nor he refrained from the food he is not supposed to eat. Will he ever recover from his illness? He will never recover from his illness. And this is exactly what's happening with us and the shaitan. Satan, as we know it, or as we know him, he is our fierce enemy. Allah Azza wa Jal told us in the Quran that he is our enemy. Not only that, but we should take him as an enemy as well. Subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, surely Satan is an enemy to you, so take him or treat him as an enemy, he only invites his followers that they may become the dwellers of the blazing fire. So Satan, as we know, is our enemy. But do we treat him as an enemy? It's very difficult. The answer would be no. And why is that? Because we don't see him. If he, if he were a person in front of me, I would have probably grappled with him, pinned him to the ground, maybe had a choke, uh, a hold on his neck and, and break his neck. It's very easy for me because I can see him face to face. So many times I say to him, be a man, come and face me face to face. But he never comes face to face. Allah describes him in the Quran that he sees us and his tribe from where we are unable to see them. So if someone comes to you and tells you that, Wallah, yesterday I saw Satan or saw a devil, and devil, the devil was talking to me, and I have the ability to see jinn, then know that he is not telling the truth or he is imagining these things. 
So how would we take him as an enemy? You have to learn about him. You have to know everything about Satan, not to respect him, but to be aware of him. If you look at the Prophet ﷺ, he explained to us everything that is bad and the things that we should avoid and stay away from. But he never tried any of these things ﷺ. He told us do not consume alcohol, intoxicants in general. Did he ever tr try it, taste it? I've seen some brothers trying these things. What are you drinking? said gin and tonic. Why? So I can give da'wah to people and tell them about the bad effect of it. MashaAllah. Some people go to the nightclubs and dancing and, and having fun and partying. Why? Said, when I talk to the guys, to the youth, I'd like to know where they're coming from. This is not the way. Allah Azza wa Jal who created us, He told us what's good for us and what's not. Because He knows His creation. If you buy a Sony PlayStation, you would not get the Nintendo uh, manual to operate it. You will go to the Sony manual because they created it. They know how it works. And likewise, and Allah has the higher example, He created us. He knows, subhanahu wa ta'ala, what works for us and what does not. Satan was created from, from fire. And the angel, <coughs> angels were created from, from light. And Satan, as scholars say, is the father of all jinn. And the jinn are divided into devils and righteous and believing jinn. We can't see them. We know their existence. We know that they fear us more than, the, than we fear them. But the minute we fear them, they take control over us. And that is why a believer does not fear jinn. He's not afraid of jinn, he's not afraid of dark places, and he's not afraid of things possessing him. He has his full trust in Allah. So if someone says, listen, I'm a sorcerer, I'm going to put a spell on you, give it your best shot. I have Allah with me. The jinn would come over you if you do this, if you could do that. People are afraid always of jinn. Why are you afraid of jinn? Allah is with you. So the devil is the... Or Satan is the father of all devils and all jinn. His relation with us started before Allah created Adam. When Allah created Adam, Allah instructed Satan to prostrate. Did he comply? He refused. He did what all of us are doing nowadays, and which is one of the means of leading people to hellfire. That is using our logic against the Qur'an and the Sunnah, against the commands. Allah tells him, prostrate to, say, to, prostrate to Adam. He says, why? I'm better than he is. I was created from fire and he was created from clay. And definitely fire is better than clay. I will not prostrate. This is exactly what's happening to the Muslims nowadays. You get people coming and rejecting verses of the Qur'an. Rejecting the Sunnah. Why? Because it's not logical. I can't accept this. Well, if you reject this, you cannot accept Islam. Because Islam is submission to Allah, the Almighty. And you're not submitting your will to Allah, the Almighty. If you know Satan and his enmity <coughs> towards us, you know that he will do all what he can so that we can accompany him in hellfire. And we know for sure that he is the most experienced person on earth. When you submit or you go and try to get a job, you present your CV, right? You have your resume and you give it to your employer. Maximum three pages, four pages, all the experience you have and all the education and courses. Satan has a gazillion page CV. It goes from Adam's time and up to today. How many people had he managed to get astray? How many people he managed and succeeded in throwing in hell? 
how many people he managed to get them fornicating, consuming intoxicants, killing, looting, beating people, disobeying their parents, cutting their ties with their next of kin, lying, backbiting, hearts full of grudges and hatred to every single person on earth. All of these are the handicraft of Satan. So he is quite experienced in this sense. Now, if we know this, we know that to avoid Satan, we have to know where he comes to us. Where does Satan come to us from? The scholars say there are many places that he comes through, but Allah Azza wa had put the heart in a very concealed place. So it's difficult to reach the heart straight away. Yet he can reach the heart through passages. There is a sight, so he reaches your heart through things you see. There is the hearing, so he reaches your heart through the things you hear. There is the, the mouth, so whatever you consume, you eat and you drink, he goes in and penetrates your heart. And is there are also your private organs, your private parts, which a person's enjoyment and sexuality is defined through. So these are mainly the ways he comes into a person's heart trying to corrupt his heart. Now, if you try to go to a list of things that Satan manages to come through or to do, the Prophet tells us والسلام, that Satan or the devil runs through our veins like blood. So he's with us all the time. Not only that, to the extent that he may even come to the most righteous person. The Prophet والسلام, as in the Sahih, he was once with Mother Safiya. And of course you all know Safiya. She is no, the wife of the Prophet as a son. It's a good answer. Safiya bint, bint Abdullah, bint Muhammad, bint Ismail. She's the wife of the Prophet. She's your mother. What's your mother's name? Aisha. Okay, good. You have eight other mothers. She was the daughter of a Jewish enemy. Yes, she was the daughter of a Jewish enemy of the Prophet. Her name was Safiya bint Huyay ibn Akhtab. And this is a problem, because if we say, like, for example, what, uh, what is the name of the best five, ten soccer players in, in Britain, Pro probably people would know them by heart. If you say, okay, what about the ten uh, top uh, R&B songs, or uh, uh, rap songs, or uh, what, ten best movies, uh, Narina, is it? I saw it on, on the way coming here. What, the, the top highest uh, paid movie in, in, in North America. But when it comes to the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, we fail to know them. When it comes to the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, we fail to know them. When it comes to the Qur'an, when it comes to the Sunnah. So, what is it that we know of our religion? Isn't it a problem on the Day of Judgment when Allah Azza with His grace and mercy, admits us to paradise? People go in and say, who's this? He said, Abu Bakr. MashaAllah. And who's this? It's Umar. Don't know him. Who's this? Abdullah ibn Zubair. Who's this? Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Guys, they are great people. They're pious people. But I don't know them. <coughs> so anyway, let's take a tour down to hell. You go to hell. Yo! Oh, all of these are our friends. These are the people I know. This is a big problem. No, seriously, it, it's funny, but this is, a, this is true. Who do you want to be friend with? This guy, this celebrity, this person. But what about the companions of the Prophet ﷺ? You don't even know them. So many times, I'm talking about Saudi Arabia, about the Arabs who study Islamic studies in their intermediate, <coughs> primary, high school, college. And I used to tell them, when did Uhud take place? Which year in Hijri? They say five. 
Is it wrong? Four. Is it wrong? What is this? You don't know when Uhud took place? He said, what's Uhud, Sheikh? <laughs> okay, I'm in the wrong place. You have to know your history. You know, you have to, you have to know your heritage. You have to know your religion. If you love the Prophet ﷺ, and you don't know nothing about him or about his companions, you have a problem. The Prophet ﷺ was walking once at night with Safiya, his wife. And two of the Ansar, two men, were coming in his way. When they saw the Prophet with a woman, they immediately changed direction. They didn't want to come in contact with the Prophet ﷺ while he's with a female companion. Now, they definitely did not think anything negative about the Prophet ﷺ. Yet the Prophet called them. And he said, ﷺ, you, so and so and so and so, this is my wife, Safiya. She's covered from head to toe. But just to inform them that this is my wife and her name is Safiya. And they said, stop it, it's Prophet, subhanAllah. Do you think we're going to doubt you? And then the Prophet said, well, shay uh, shaitan, Satan, goes through your veins like blood. And I was afraid that he may cast something in your heart, doubt about me, that would nullify your Islam. So I, ha so I had to clarify this for your sake and for the sake of safeguarding my reputation. And if, if, if you see someone doing something bad, he has to clarify and, 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 and purify his reputation. If you saw me, for example, going down the stairs in a, a big hotel, and down in the basement there's a nightclub. And by mistake, I'm going down. I don't know the hotel. I don't know the place. What would you think? Oh, Sheikh, you evil devil. <laughs> ah, now I know the Sheikh. <laughs> Time to groove. I said, no, 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 listen. I, I have to stop. And I have to listen, brother. I'm, I don't know where I'm going. I want to go to the loo. I want to go to my room. I don't want to go to the, to the, to the lift. But I, I lost my way. So don't. Yeah, I have to defend my reputation and to clarify things. It's not easy and it's not proper just to say, the hell with everybody else. Who cares? I know myself. No. And this is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ did. So, shaitan runs through our veins. Not only that, he drinks and eats with us. Imagine inviting shaitan to eat with you. Welcome, come let's have a bite. This is what a lot of Muslims do. Whenever you eat or drink and you don't say Bismillah, he eats with you. And a lot of Muslims forget to say Bismillah. I have my youngest daughter's uh, uh, daughter, well she's second youngest, She's about four years old. Whenever we sit on a table, in the middle of the meal, everybody's eating. She says, who forgot to say Bismillah? She's four, five, four and five years. And, and she goes and says, if you forgot, say Bismillah, awalihi wa akhiri, which means in the beginning and in the end. The Prophet told us that if whoever forgets and says this in the middle of the meal, shaitan throws up what he ate. So a lot of the Muslims, unknowingly, they invite shaitan to eat with them. Shaitan also sleeps over. The Prophet tells us whenever someone gets into his house and forgets to mention the name of Allah, Satan or the devil calls his companions, come, come, we're staying, we're sleeping over the brother's house. He forgot to say Bismillah when he entered the, the house. And if he eats, Without saying Bismillah, Shaitan tells his companions, MashaAllah, we have food and we have lodging. So they've got all of this made. The Prophet ﷺ told us, and this is something that a lot of the Muslims don't do. Whenever you wake up, what's the first thing you do? You said, according to the Sunnah. Actions, not, not, not uh, words. You, first of all, you wash your hands. Because the Prophet says you don't know where your hand had spent the night. So you might, might have touched something, something that was impure. But even if you knew where your hands were, you have, still have to wash them. Meaning that if I sleep, said, okay, before I go to bed, I'm going to trick shaitan. I'm going to put my hands in gloves. And when I wake up, I just take them off. Do I have to wash my hands? Yes, you have to. But I know where my hands were. 
But still, you're doing this because the Prophet ﷺ told you to do so. So you wash your hands three times. And then you pull the water up your nostrils and take the water off again three times. Why? The Prophet said that the devil sleeps on your nostrils. I, didn't, I don't see any, anybody bothering me or sleeping yet. Well, you don't see him. So you have to believe in this. And, you, and I do this, you do this, all of you, of course, do this because it's part of the sunnah and we believe in the unseen. We haven't seen Allah, have we? So we believe in Allah Azza wa because it's overwhelming the evidences around us. No one is, is a fool to say that, except the atheist, of course, to say that <laughs> there is no God. And some scholars say that the atheists are close to us because they say there is no God. So we have to complete except Allah. So they're halfway with us in the Shahada. They say there is no God, and we say there is no God worthy of being worshipped except Allah. So it's, we're meeting halfway. So the shaitan sleeps over our nostrils. We have to do this when we wake up. Not only that, the Prophet said, the hadith is in the Sahih, that it's in Sahih al-Bukhari, al, 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 al and in the other books of, of the Sahih as well. The Prophet says, والسلام, when they pointed out to him that this man overslept until it was daytime, he did not pray Fajr, and some scholars say that he did not pray Witr, night prayer. But let's give it to the benefit of the doubt and say that he did not pray Fajr until the sun rose. What did the Prophet say? He said that that was a man who the devil urinated in his ear. This is so hard to accept. When I skip the Fajr prayer, shaitan urinates in my ear? Yes, if you oversleep until the sun has risen, if it's by accident, it's okay, inshallah, because Allah knows that this is not your habit. But if you deliberately set your alarm clock to go off at <coughs> 7 o'clock, 7.30, now I think it's, it's okay, 7 o'clock, 7.30, Fajr is late, but when it's really uh, in summer, and the Fajr is like 2.30. Who wakes up for, for Fajr prayer? Who believes, to begin with, that Allah is the provider? We believe that Barclay Bank, Bank is, is the provider. If we don't do it, we're not going to get a pay check. So people skip Fajr prayer for the work, for the schools, for anything. Because it's too early. This is the person that Satan takes as his uh, 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 public loop. He urinates every single morning in his ears. And you cannot see his urine. You cannot see this. You cannot see his urine. You cannot see him. But you can definitely feel the impact on your heart. So many times these people complain. We have a dead heart. We have hearts as hard as stone. Why can't we understand the Quran? Why can't we feel so uh, the passion to learn about Islam? Why don't we fear Allah when we pray? Or let me rephrase that. Why don't we pray to begin with? Well, simply because of the blockage caused between your senses and your heart due to this urine of, of shaitan. May Allah protect us all. The Prophet ﷺ also told us that he goes through our mouths. Whenever you yawn and you open your mouth, he goes in and he laughs at you. That's why the Prophet says, whenever you have the urge to yawn, you all you have to do is to try to oppress it. Close your mouth. If it's overwhelming, then put your hand on your mouth. And this is what the Prophet instructed us. There is a, a, a devil who is specialized, and they have specialized devils, you know, they have their departments. This one is for this, this one is for that, and they have job descriptions, and they have a, a, whole, a whole excellent network, unfortunately. There is a devil who is specialized of wudu, of evolution. And whenever you go to the toilets and perform evolution, according to the sunnah, you finish in like 20 seconds. 
and you find people have been spending there like five, seven minutes, ten minutes, just rubbing, washing, and ironing, and what is this, what is this guy doing? I remember once I was in Syria, and I went to the uh, uh, washing rooms, made wudu, and before me was a man soaked in water. He was obsessed, you know, rubbing his arms and washing, and okay. We left the washing rooms together. We came into Salah. We started Salah, and the guy said, Allahu Akbar, al, al, al. I think the guy, maybe he needed a push to, to, to complete the thing. I was already engaged in Salah. So I forgot about him, and then the guy left. And he came a while later, still soaked in water, and he three, four times left and came back, going, making wudu and coming back, and nullifying his salah and going, making wudu, and he distracted my prayer. Actually, I was, you know, just seeing this guy coming and going, coming and going. My whole prayer was gone, gone down the drain, unfortunately. <laughs> After the prayer has finished, the guy kept on going, like for 20, 30 minutes, off and on, did not pray. And nothing is wrong with him. It's this obsession. This is a, there is a psychological uh, uh, disorder, uh, compulsive, whatever, yeah, you know. I don't know it in Arabic, so. There are people that when you go to the toilet, you hear them and, you know, when they're urinating, coughing, and <coughs> guys have an asthma problem or something. And he, he just wait outside for 10 minutes, and then he's coughing, and then you hear people jumping, and you know, doing karate kicks, and you, you can hear that. What is he doing? After half an hour, he comes out, completely drained, tired. What are we doing? He said, Wallah, Ya Sheikh, I have a problem. I've been ha having this problem for 10 years. What's that? He said, every time I urinate, I get the feeling that there's a drop or two missing. So I squeeze myself, I do this, I jump, and, and even after half an hour I go out of the, uh, of the toilet and I still have this uh, 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 feeling, I don't pray. I have to go home, change and, and my underwears and then pray home. And sometimes the time goes out and, well, and they are suffering. Why are they suffering from? It's our friend. Well, actually, he's not a friend, he's a, our enemy, but this is his specialty. A, a shaitan designated for wudu. His, his name is Al-Walhan. Even the Prophet is telling us his name. And there is a shaitan specialized in prayer. His name is Khanzab. And this guy's job is whenever you start to pray, he starts to remind you. Ha, ah, your mobile is in the car. Somebody's gonna break the window and takes it off of you. Khalas, your prayer is gone. While in your prayer, he reminds, mo he reminds you of everything. Everything you almost forgot, subhanAllah, it's all coming back to you. Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy on his soul, a man came to him and said, Shaykh, I buried my savings somewhere and I put a sign in the desert. And now I completely forgot everything where it is. It's all my life savings. He said, no problem. When after Isha, and when it's the last third of the night, just like three hours before Fajr, wake up and pray ten rak'ahs and try to be as perfect as you can in prayer, prolong the surah, have your heart to Allah Azza wa Jal. The guy started the first rak'ah, the second rak'ah, he remembered. So he wrapped the prayer and he went to the place and he found it and he took it and he came back to Abu Hanifa and he said, Zakallah khair, this was a, a magical formula. How, how did you come to know about it? He said, this is who made you forget was shaitan. As Allah said, وَمَا أَنْسَانِهُ إِلَّا الشَّيْطَانِ and أَذْكُرَهُ It's only Satan who made me forget it. So when he saw your first rak'ah and said, listen, uh, the guy is going to pray nine other rak'ahs. This good? Allah is going to forgive all of his sins. No, I think I can compromise. <laughs> listen, the place is here and there. And the guy went and found it where it was. So this is his role to destroy your salah. In Saudi Arabia, a lot of these incidents happen. I don't know about here. But 
so many times in Saudi Arabia I get people coming saying, Sheikh, I can't pray in the masjid anymore. Why? Say, Sheikh, the, 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 the smell of the socks kills me in front of me. So, don't breathe when you're prostrating. You know, hold your breath. So, Sheikh, and the man next to me is always picking his nose and, and playing with his clothes. And the other one is always coughing. And the air conditioning is too hot, it's too cold. And at the end of the day, Shaitan takes over and he does not pray. I had a cousin, and this is my cousin, who may Allah have mercy on his soul. He was one of the guys giving da'wah at the time of Jihiman. You know Jihiman, you don't know Jihiman, so probably you were not born. This was about uh, 32 years ago when a group of extremist terrorists overtook the Haram. And they had these weird ideas, violent ideas, and they spread terror in the Haram, in the, the Masjid of Mecca. And they prevented people from doing tawaf, from praying. They were not devious in the sense that they were misled, misguided, and they did one of the most major sins of Islam. Yet, this caused all people who had beards to be collected and interrogated with. And one of them was my cousin, who was a peaceful guy, you know, down to earth. But when they interrogated him and he came back, he got things confused. The guy used to give lectures, give nasiha. Now, he wasn't a student of knowledge, but he was uh, an enthusi enthusiastic person. He started to pray in the masjid, he's not allowed to talk for a while, and then he started retreating to the back rows, and then he stopped coming to the masjid. So I visited at home. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I thought of it, and I think that Allah wants us to pray a prayer with contemplation, with concentration, with submissiveness, and in today's masjids, I'm not able to do this. Kids are play playing in the background, the imam's voice is ugh, uh, it's awful and the people next to me they don't put perfumes or they don't wear deodorants and they're smelly and people getting garlic and this guy smokes and this guy is this so he looks only at the negative sides so and he says that this entitles me I think to pray in home <coughs> so he started praying home for a while I gave him nasiha he was not good enough he started to pray home and after a while, his mom told me that he's praying now in a room, a special room. Why? He says, because I want to make sure that this room is clean, it's pure, there's no najasa, no impurities, nobody comes in. Okay. Then he went to phase three. He started turning off the ACs in 50 centigrade heat and turns off the light. Why? Because he says, I, I get closer to Allah when I do this. And after a while, he stopped praying altogether. He quit praying, khalas, he doesn't pray anymore. And he died not praying. May Allah have mercy on his soul, because I believe that he is not sane. And he did not leave prayer because he was convinced that it's okay, the guy lost it. So, this is where shaitan comes through, and this is one of the means that he uses. How much time do I have? No, I would like to stick with the schedule of the brothers. Okay. Now, now my shaitan is coming to me. I'm going to stay here all night and miss all the action outside. Okay. No problem. Uh, Allah Azza wa Jal talks to us in the Quran and He tells us do not follow the steps or the footsteps of shaitan, which means that shaitan does not come bluntly to you and says, do this. He has steps. And this is very smart of him. Now, if shaitan wants to <coughs> lure me and seduces me, he would not say, Sheikh Asim, how about going and, and, and fornicating, and, you know, uh, prior chance, you're in the UK, come on, look for some woman and get down. <laughs> <laughs> what would I say? What would I say? Just stop for Allah. Crazy? After all these years? Come on! I fear Allah Azza wa Jal. Get out of here! So, he doesn't come like this. He comes and says, 
Sheikh, um, for da'wa purposes, why don't you surf the net and try to see what's going on? And then oh, this, this check the top 10 movies, for example. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. I'm talking to the youth, right? I have to know these things. So, looking at them, so, oh, well, this is a nice title. Sheikh, looking is, is okay. <laughs> Come on, it's not a porn. Rated uh, PG, probably. It's a family movie. It's okay. Okay, you watch this. Then he tells you, okay, what about listening to music? And you're, you're tensed. You know, what about chilling down a little bit? Listen to a song. Well, it's in the radio. I'm listening, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to, the, to the news. A, a song comes. So what's wrong in listening to uh, uh, Celine Dion or Maria Carey or whatever? Just, uh, come on. It's okay. You listen to that for a while without noticing your heart is being infested bit by bit. Then comes another opportunity. A woman comes in and says, Hi, I'd like to know about Islam. And she's extending her arm to you. Okay, I have to weigh the advantages and disadvantages for the sake of Islam. It's okay. <laughs> Please, sit down. We talk, we mix, for the sake of Islam. How about having dinner tonight? We can discuss this over at dinner. And bit by bit by bit, you find all the red tape is becoming purple, pink, and then white. There's no red tape. And this is when shaitan comes. In Surah Al-Hashr, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions three verses. And the people of Tafsir back this explanation of this by stories from Bani Israel. And in the Hadith, we are instructed to mention these Hadiths, though they are not authentic, but they don't go against our beliefs and our practice. So, if it's not against it, then it's okay to comment on it and talk about it. Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Al-Hashr, كمثل الذين من قبلهم قريبا ذاقوا وبال أمرهم ولهم عذاب عذاب أليم كمثل الشيطان إذ قال للإنسان كفر فلما كفر قال إني بريء منك إن إني أخاف الله رب العالمين فكان عاقبتهما أنهما في النار خالدين فيها وذلك جزاء الظالمين. Allah Azza wa Jal is giving us an example of Satan who came to a righteous person. This was, as in, 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 in the stories of Bani Israel, was a monk. He was in his uh, sawma, his prayer hall, whatever, where they isolate themselves in. And he was worshipping Allah for so many years. And everybody thought of him as their best. Satan tried so many times with him, no avail. No way. So he thought of a very devious plan. And he went to three people who were warriors and were off to battle. They had a sister. So they tried to keep the sister somewhere safe. They couldn't. So they went to this monk and they told him, we would like you to take care of our sister. He said, no way. I have enough in my hands and I'm up there and I'm not socializing with anyone. They kept on you know, telling him, please, please, our sister will be uh, uh, lost and she would need protection. And Shaitan came to him and says, listen, let you run on top of a hill. Let them put her in a cottage at the bottom of the hill, far away from you. And all what you do is you oversee the cottage. Nothing is happening. You bring her food once a day. You put it in the middle of the road and you immediately go. And she takes care of herself. So she agreed. He agreed. And she used to do this, and he used to do this, no contact. After a while, Satan put step number two, saying to him, listen, when you put the food in the middle of the road, a beast can come and eat it. Someone else can come and take it. So the least you could do is just put it on the doorsteps. Okay? Logical. So he started doing this for a while. And she used to take the food, no contact. After a while, he said, listen, when she opens the door, she is exposed to passers-by. People may see her. So you take the food inside and leave. And he did. After a while, listen, she is lonely. And 
it's best for you to give her guidance. She doesn't have, you know, Huda TV or Peace TV. She doesn't have anything. So at least teach her something, you know, it's halal, haram. Give her some da'wah. So he started teaching her about their religion, let's say, fiqh, aqidah, and so on. And after a while, they started eating together. And after a while, the inevitable took place. This is his way of doing it. Not only that, she got pregnant. He wasn't taking the measures not to. He didn't know at the time. But shaitan came to him and said, whoops, you have a problem. Then what to do? He said, listen, if the, the brothers come back, you are in deep waters. So what should I do? He said, the best thing is that you wait until she gives birth and dispose of the child. And as if nothing happened. Okay. After nine months, she gave birth to a baby boy. He took the boy, beheaded it, and threw it in a hole to bury it. Then he came back to him and said, listen, do you think that the mother is going to hush hush about everything? The minute her brothers come, she's going to tell them about it. She's, her heart is broken. What to do? Get rid of the, 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 the mother. So he, he killed the mother. He threw her with the child in that big hole, buried her, put a big rock on top of her, went back to his mountain and started worshipping Allah as nothing had happened. Months later, they came back. They asked about their sister. He weeped and cried and said she was a very righteous and pious woman. So Allah, may Allah forgive her. May Allah forgive her. She was an excellent woman. Anyhow, and, but she died. She got sick and she died. So I buried her. And they felt sorry and they went home. They went to bed and Satan came to each one of them, telling them, do you believe this man? He did this and that, and he buried her in that spot. They woke up very sad and depressed and, and, and annoyed, but they didn't talk about it. The middle one opened the, the discussion and said, listen, I, I saw something really weird last night in my dream. The eldest and the youngest said, we had the same experience. And when they discussed it, they found it was the same dream. So they went to the location, removed the rock, dug the grave and found the remains. They went to the authorities, they handcuffed the man, dragged him on his face to be cross, uh, uh, um, crucified, is the word? To crucified and then killed. And khalas, it, he was sentenced to be crucified. And then Satan came to him and said, now listen, I'm your friend. I'm the one who made you do this and this and this and this and this. And your only means of salvation, if you want to be saved, is that you prostrate to me. And the monk said, I prostrate to you and you save me? He said, definitely, I did all of this. So he prostrated to the devil. And then the devil said, I have nothing to do with you. And he ran away and left him. This is exactly what's happening to a lot of us. The steps of Satan. Take, for example, drugs. And allow me to drink. It's a custom that we invite you to what uh, I'm having, but I'm think, I don't think it's, it's enough. <clears throat> Take drugs, for example. If a person who is, who is like 16 or 17 years old, would he try drugs without going through phases? He has to smoke first, right? No one goes to, to, to doing marijuana or, or, or hash or whatever without smoking, regular cigarettes. After you do this, you used to go to step two, maybe have a beer or two. After you do this, then you go to something that is, actually, I should go lower instead of higher. You go to something that is more degrading. To ma These are the steps of shaitan, and it goes everywhere in our lives. You will not find someone stealing, robbing a bank, before he robs an apple from uh, 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 the vegetable store next door. And, and this is how he uh, deteriorates and goes on and on. If you look at individual basis, Satan is always in the places where angels are not present. This is a fact. Because devils are afraid of angels. 
In our houses, what are the things that prevent angels from coming in? Statues. Dogs. Swearing? Mm. There are in. They, they, no, it does not, we don't have any sound uh, evidence that uh, it prevents them. But it's actually true in the hadith where Abu Bakr was with the Prophet and there was a man, he came and started saying bad things to Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr was looking at the Prophet and he was tolerating. And the guy said, you did this, you did that, who are you, what tribe are you coming from? And Abu Bakr, we know he's the second man in Islam. Yeah, he's the best second person after the Prophet And he did not talk, but after a while, he got agitated, so he answered him back. He did not do anything wrong, you know, he, he's just answering back to one, what a person is telling him. And then the Prophet left, So Abu Bakr said, Oh Prophet of Allah, you heard the man say what he said, and you did not leave. And when I answered him back, you left? In a sense, he's saying, is this fair? The Prophet told him, Abu Bakr, when the man was saying what he was saying, there was an angel defending you. So the man said, you're a dog. He said, you're the dog. You're this, and you know, you're this. The angel is saying this. He's defending you. The minute you started replying to him and answering him, the angel, angel left. And when the angel left, I cannot sit in a place where the devil is present. So he left. So again, this is a good point the brothers mentioned, which is swearing makes the angels go away. This is true. This is from the Sunnah. So we have to protect our houses. If it has instruments that would draw uh, 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 angels away, musical instruments, inter instruments of entertainment that is haram, I went to some of the brothers' uh, houses with all these big PV speakers and, and, and blowers and, and tranquilizers. I don't know what they call it. <laughs> Things are, whew, what is this? And say, oh, Sheikh, you did not see my car. What's with your car? In the back of his car, it's all you know, speakers and, okay, what are you doing? And I know that if you want to listen to music, listen on your own. But if you want to propagate the sin that so that everybody else is sharing it with you, then you are an advocate of the devil. You are working for shaitan. You're one of his greatest tools in luring people uh, to him. Uh, I wrote a very short list of the things I would, wanted to talk about. Apparently it's taking us too much time. But how does shaitan get hold of us? What's the easy, when do you find yourself defenseless uh, uh, against his attacks? When you're alone. When you're alone. The Prophet والسلام, said that when a man is alone, he's vulnerable to the attacks of shaitan. Because he's closer to the lonely person than he's closer to the one with another person. Because the wolf, when it attacks a herd of sheep, it does not attack the whole herd. It waits when one of the sheep is isolated, then it takes it off guard. Also, how about when you are in the state of rage? Do you feel shaitan is there? Do you feel him present? He is there because this is when he plays with the people like the kids play with football. The Prophet ﷺ, the hadith in the Sahih al-Bukhari, was with his companions when two men were arguing and one of them had his eyes red and you know his, his face was swollen and he was shouting and all the veins you can see it and the Prophet said that it, it was not a nice scene to see. The Prophet said to his companions, I know a word. If he had said it, all of this would go away. What is the word? A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajim. I seek refuge in Allah Azza wa Jal from the outcast devil, shaitan. So one of the companions heard this and said, okay, I'm going to give nasiha, I'm going to give advice to that man. And he shouldn't have, because the Prophet, if he wanted to, he would have given it to him or he would have instructed him to do this. But the man thought to do well of his own. So he went to the guy, the guy is so angry, he said, 
the Prophet said, say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem. Did the guy say, Oh, Jazakallah Khair. That was, this is what I was waiting for. You the one. The guy blew in his face and said, Get out of here. Do you think I'm crazy? So he, he's, uh, you know, uh, uh, making another fight with this guy who was giving him advice. When anger and rage controls a person, it's Satan in the driver's seat. He's taking control of you. So many times I get calls on the mobile. Sheikh, I have a problem. What's your problem? I divorced my wife and I'm sorry. And I'm, uh, and he starts weeping. Why did you divorce your wife? And she, she, she said, you're not a man. <laughs> <laughs> so, my wife tells me this all the time. I have no problem with that. She says, it's a, a, an hour of the shaitan. The woman calls me. Another woman calls and she says, Sheikh, and she's crying. My husband divorced me. Why? What did you do? Nothing. I was just, you know, talking with him and I got carried out away and I was angry. I said, divorce me, divorce me, divorce me. <laughs> and I kept nagging for about like six hours. And at night time, he just said, you divorced. Do you imagine this Sheikh? He divorced me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you expect him to do after six hours of nagging him? And when the, the husband calls me and I say, why did you do this, uh, brother? He says, Sheikh, she took the keys of the house. She locked me in. And she took, my, she took my glasses off. And if I'm in a room, she turns off the air condition. She turns on the lights. She turns off the lights. And she's nagging and screaming and shouting. What do you want me to do? <coughs> Wallahi, yachi, how many times you divorce her? She says, one. So give her another one. On the house. <laughs> so when anger overtakes you, you don't see, you're blinded. And this is exactly what every Muslim should not do, get angry. A man came to the Prophet and said, Oh Prophet of Allah, advise me. Give me advice. So he said, do not become angry. Okay, give me another one. He said, do not become angry. Do not become angry. Do not become angry. The Prophet kept on repeating it, alayhi salatu only this word, la taghdab, which means that it is an extremely important thing not to do, which is to get angry. And this is another topic. Among the things that shaitan gets into our hearts is envy. When you, it's envy when you see someone having something and you say, ah, he doesn't deserve this. I should have got this. Why does he have this beautiful car? He, he's not worthy of it. He, he can't even drive. I'm a better man. So he destroys the heart. You see someone who's knowledgeable. I see someone who's knowledgeable and say, come on, look at him. He doesn't work out in the gym. Why, why is he, everybody's respecting him? Well, I've got, I got muscles. I'm, I'm better built than he is. I see someone with lots of money. I say, subhanAllah, why does Allah give him this money? I've been praying here for so many years and Allah did not give me as much. Do you believe it? I heard this with my own ears. I was with, visiting an old man. He was about 65 years old. And he's a, a pious person. He prays in the masjid, mashallah, all five uh, times <clears throat> in Saudi. And he got sick. And he was sick for a while. So I went to him, you know, comforted him. I'm, I'm inshallah, my uncle. Allah will forgive your sins because of your tolerance and your patience. He said, my son, the only thing that bothers me is that I've been praying for 40 years, not missing one salah for Allah Azza wa Jal. And I've been trying to be as good as possible and look how it ended, this illness. And my neighbor, who never prayed one single prayer in the masjid, he's as strong as a, as a bull. And I was saying, I'm, uncle, you are nullifying all of your good deeds by one word. You're, you're objecting to Allah's ruling? Look at the way that envy comes and corrupts your heart. Instead of accepting what Allah has bestowed upon you, had decreed upon you, say, khalas, Allah gave it to me, I'm accepting it, Allah, alhamdulillah, azza wa jal. No, you're rejecting it and objecting. This is what happened to uh, Qabil and Habil, Cain and, and Abel. Mm -hmm. You call it? Yeah. When Allah accepted his <coughs> sacrifice, his, uh, 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 the things that he offered, and did not accept the other man's sacrifice, he felt envious and he killed his brother. Siblings, 
what did Yusuf face? Peace be upon him. He was thrown in the well. They wanted to kill him at first. Why? They were envious. Why? Because of his degree? Because of uh, his wealth? Because his father favored him. And his father was a prophet. A son of a prophet. And a son of a prophet. When the prophet, as a son, uh, our prophet Muhammad was asked, who is the most honorable person? He said, Yusuf, Ibn Ya'qub, Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Ibrahim, a prophet, the son of a prophet, the son of a prophet, and the son of a prophet, four prophets in a row. Yet his siblings, who are the sons of a prophet, took him and threw him in a well. Why? Envy. So when people get envious, and when they look at each other, instead of appreciate, appreciating Allah's gifts, and they start to envy people, then they will not accept uh, uh, anything and they will let shaitan come to their way people are yawning and getting sleep uh, so I'm gonna I have so many things uh, uh, ahead of me but inshallah uh, what we have heard is is more than enough there is well let me conclude with this there is one of the the, the, the easiest ways for shaitan to come through our hearts is the companionship. Who is your companion? I can determine if you are on the right path or on the wrong path. Because shaitan comes with the bad companion. The Prophet والسلام, told us that a good companion is like a person who sells perfumes. If you go into a place that sells perfumes, either you buy perfume, which means that you're going to get a good smell, or you're going to try, you know, some of the sheep people, instead of buying perfume, say, oh, how much is this? So, so and so pound. Uh, can I smell? Mm, yeah, that's good. Mm, okay, thanks. And they leave. So either you buy it off them, or you get a gift. And you get a good fragrance. This is a good companion. He either teaches you, or you learn his manners, or he corrects you when you do something that is wrong. A bad companion is completely the opposite. Shaitan comes to, through, to our hearts through bad companions. You know, peer pressure, if I'm at school, if I'm a good person, my parents are good, but look at my companions. In the break, my friend comes, want a fag? Fancy a fag? <laughs> no, I don't smoke. Well, ain't you man? Come on, give it a try. It's not going to kill you, it's going to kill you, it's going to kill you later on, not now. So everybody's smoking, you don't know that he's not smoking. Yes. Yeah, and you start coughing for the first time, but then it becomes part of your manhood. You know, feeling ma macho when you smoke. And then they tell you, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And you feel that there is a benchmark you're trying to reach up to, but it's not up to, it's downwards. They are the bad influence. And on the Day of Judgment, they will be your enemy. As Allah says that, Al-Akhillau yawma'idin, on the day of judgment, the best of friends would be the fierce enemies, except those who were righteous in this world. Because on the day of judgment, you'll start to show your enmity to the person who made you do this and who taught you how to do this. And he would say, I didn't teach him anything. He came to me, he asked me, and they would become enemies. So you have to choose your companions, you have to choose your friends, you have to choose someone who would guide you, who would lead you, who would accompany you to Allah, instead of choosing someone who would guide you and lead you to a present self, whether it is with a group or a, a solitary confinement, it's still present. So you have to choose someone who shows you the light, who guides you to it, who gives you advice, and you would feel good being with. There are a lot of uh, topics to be covered, but inshallah, this is more than enough. Uh, and, and I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that He keeps us away from Shaitan and keeps Shaitan away from our path. Wallahu alam. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa baraka ala abdi wa rasulina bina Muhammad. I think we have time for questions. If the people are still awake. If not, we wrap it up and call it a day.
Question, yes, brother. Who's Cain and Abel? Who's? Cain and Abel. They are the sons of Adam. You know Adam. He's the father of all humanity. When he was descended because of his sin, because of eating, who made him eat the, uh, uh, the forbidden fruit? Our friend, our enemy, Satan. So that's why we, do we love the guy or we hate him? We hate Satan. He made him eat from the forbidden fruit, Allah punished him, and he made him live on earth. And that is why we're living on earth, waiting for the time we die and go to paradise back again. Depending on our good deeds. If we do well, the minute we die, we go to paradise. If we do bad, the minute we die, we go to hell. Adam had two sons. He had Cain and Abel. And because there were no humans at the time, his wife, Hawa, or Eve, used to have twins. So the first twins were a boy and a girl. The second twins were a boy and a girl. These twins cannot marry each other because they are siblings but they can marry from the other twins. So Cain and Abel were instructed to give sacrifice to Allah Azza wa Jal. Cain gave sacrifice, as the story says, of uh, 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 grass and fruits and vegetables, something that was not worthy. Abel gave a big ram, the finest he had. So Allah Azza wa Jal sent a fire and it took Abel's sacrifice and Allah accepted his and he did not accept Cain's uh, sacrifice. Cain felt angry, envious, and he killed his brother. Got it? Inshallah. Yes, ma'am. Well, <clears throat> generally speaking, the angels, they have stronger powers than the devils. And the devils, the shayateen, fear the angels. Yet, there are places that, generally speaking, the devils don't come in because of the presence of, shayt of, of, of uh, the angels, but this does not mean that they don't come in at all. On the contrary, the Prophet tells us that whenever the Mu'adhin calls for the Adhan, the devil runs away once he hears the Adhan and he does this while farting. <laughs> Seriously, this is a hadith. It, it shows that, well, he did not eat something that made him have gas, but usually when people are afraid of something, they seem to fart because of their fear. And he's doing this while running away from the masjid. The minute the Adhan is over, he comes back. So this is a special shaitan for this occasion. And we have a shaitan that does not leave us at all. And this is the Qareen. And the Prophet ﷺ, and this was mentioned in the Hadith and in, in the Sahih, where he was praying once at night ﷺ. And while he was praying, he was prostrating. And they did not have lights. So Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, woke up in the middle of the night Prophet is not here. Immediately she thought that he went to one of his other wives. So he, she, she, she sort of panicked and then she touched his feet while he was prostrating and she heard him say the supplication. And when the Prophet finished his prayer, he said, Aisha, did your devil come to you? Did your shaitan come to you? Thinking what you thought. She said, and uh, 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 do I have a devil, Ali Sassam? She said, do I have a devil? She said, everyone has a devil. He said, even you? He said, yes, even I, the Prophet of Allah, I have a devil. But Allah gave me power over him and he, and there are two narrations in Arabic, Aslam or Aslam, which means that either in, in, in English, Allah gave me powers over him to the extent that he became Muslim. So now he does not instruct me or order me ex except with good things. Or the other translation, which is the most authentic, فَأَسْلَمْ which means that I am in safeguards from his uh, 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 bad instructions. Allah gave me power over him. 
So this means that, yes, they, generally speaking, they're not in the places of angels. Whenever angels go, they come in and they fear angels. But not uh, 100%. There are special cases where they do never, ever leave us. And Allah knows best. Shaitan means a thing that excels in oppression. So there is shaitan among the dogs, for example. We are instructed to kill black dogs. And when they said the Prophet of Allah, why black dog? Any uh, uh, discrimination here? But the dogs don't. Chihuahua is okay, but black dogs. No, no. It's not this. The Prophet said that the black dog is the most fierce among its kind. It's a shaitan. Not it's a devil, but meaning that it is the most powerful and strongest and most evil among its kind. And usually I think it's a Doberman that, uh, that it is the fierce or a pit bull. Or, uh, we don't have dogs, alhamdulillah, in Saudi Arabia. I don't know their kinds, but I hear that this is the case. Therefore, uh, what was the question? No, that shaitan amongst mankind. Yeah, do we have shay, uh, shay, uh, shaitan among mankind? The last chapter in, in uh, the Quran, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ I seek refuge in Allah. مَلِكِ النَّاسِ إِلَهِ النَّاسِ مِنْ شَرْ From the evil of the whispering who retreats. الْوِسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاسِ The one who whispers in the chest or the hearts of the people. مِنْ شَرْ الَّذِي وَسْوِسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ مِنْ Al Jinnah wan Nas. So he can be from both jinn and from the people, and we have people that are so devious that even maybe the devil would say, Fear Allah, come on. <laughs> Not to that extent. We have people that are so devilish that you know you could say subhanAllah, and even the devil would say, Well, I, he surpassed me you know, a lot. And Allah knows best. So these people that are the shaitan and Muslim kind of they no, 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 no. Nobody is like this uh, uh, until they die, and unless Allah wants them to be this way, and, and they don't want to accept the truth. But we have the fierce enemies of Islam becoming the greatest Muslims. Yeah, for example, whenever I read the uh, life story of Umar ibn al Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, he wasn't among the first to embrace Islam. He was among the fierce enemies of Islam, to the extent that maybe after four or five years, I'm, I'm not sure how long, the companions decided to go to Abyssinia. So Umar passed by one of the women, the Muslim women, who was packing, and he felt soft. You know, these, these are my people. Why are they leaving their country? So he said, so you're leaving? And she said, yes. You did not leave room for us to pray and to worship Allah, so we're going to some other country. So he said, may Allah be with you. And he left. And when her husband came, he's, she told him that Umar passed by and he said this and that. He said, Umar, are you hoping that Umar accepts Islam? You're crazy. Umar's donkey may accept Islam, but Umar would not. <laughs> to that extent, he was this adamant and this... Uh, 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 level of refusing Islam, not only that, attacking Muslims and attacking Islam as well. But look what happened to him when he embraced Islam. And look what level he jumped to. So never ever underestimate anyone. Ever. People usually used to curse George Bush, you know, a few years ago when he was in power. And I would say, why curse him? May Allah guide him. He said, no way. He said, why not? No way. Guidance is in Allah's hands, it's not in ours. We do what we're supposed to do. If Allah wills it that He is guided, He can be guided. So never underestimate anyone or, you know, forget someone and say, no, this guy can never ever accept Islam. Look at us. We accepted Islam. We were even worse than they were. We, and maybe we are still, Allah, our hearts are full of corruption and of diseases and of illnesses. We're trying hard, we're struggling to purify it, we're praying to Allah, we're asking for His guidance, 
but never look down at people. Because this is one of the traps of shaitan, which I did not have time to, to uh, uh, discuss with you. When you're on top, shaitan comes to you and say, you've got it made. Halas. You're in paradise. It's only a few centimeters and you're there. So whenever someone talks to you, who are you? Look at you. You just came out of the pub. I'm a Muslim, I'm a sheikh, I'm a, a, a scholar, I'm a da'iyah. What are you? And he starts to corrupt your heart from inside. You look righteous, you look okay, but from inside, you're corrupt. No, always be modest, be humble, thinking that, I don't know, Allah will accept my deeds, all of these things that I'm doing, will Allah accept it? I have no idea. I'm trying my best and hoping for the best. But at the same time, I look at sinful people, I look at disbelievers, and I, I, know, I never know. Maybe they, in a couple of years, Allah will guide them and they, they will be way miles and miles in front of me in, in, in Islam. So I hope for the best, I work my, 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 my best, I do as hard as I can do, and at the same time, not look down at anyone. Allah knows best. Ghulu. Yeah. Yes, of course, it's one of the greatest, and this was in my HD too. I'm not advertising it, I'm trying to sell it actually. But uh, uh, this was in, in my presentation. Shaitan comes in two ways. Either through shubuhat, which are doubts, or shahawat, which are desires. Shubuhat, meaning that he comes to you in doubtful methodologies, ideologies, ideas, and he comes to people depending on the strength of their belief. So if, generally speaking, the mass of the Muslims are weak in their belief. So he comes to them and saying that, come on, Allah is kareem, Allah is forgiving, Allah is merciful, neglect this. So you come to see a brother performing wudu in, 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 in the washing rooms. And he comes out, and this area has not been touched by water. He said, brother, Allah will not accept your prayer for this. You have to wash the whole arm. Yeah, shit, come on, I wash the majority of it. Don't be extreme. Allah is forgiving. Come on. You go to a sister, she is praying, mashallah, with the hijab, with the car, and with her tight jeans. <laughs> Sis, what's this? You have to wear a whole garment that covers the whole body. She said, no, 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 come on, don't be extreme. Allah is kareem. I'm, I'm covering my head. This is the most important thing to do. Don't eat haram food. Come on, it's okay. I ask Allah for forgiveness. Don't deal in riba, interest, usury. Don't do this, don't do that. And people t seem to neglect and ignore. It's okay, it's okay. There is a group that are strong in their faith. Whenever he attempts them to do this, he says, this is, oh, I have to go by the book, I have to go by the Quran, by the Sunnah. They are steadfast on the right track. He cannot come and ask them to you know be soft so he comes and say you have to be tough you have to be stronger so you find them washing their limbs the prophet said three times they were doing it five why three we have free water alhamdulillah we have the thames next door do it five times and after a while do it seven times and after a while why not shower for every prayer it's more it's clean more more to to be more clean and fresh. Yeah, but this is innovation. Come on, what is this innovation? I'm doing it for Allah. He comes to extreme against the Quran and the Sunnah. Abu, uh, Abu Muhammad Sa'id ibn Nusayyib, may Allah be pleased with him. He was in Medina Masjid and between Adhan and Fajr of, Adhan and Iqamah of Fajr, you know? A man came and started praying two rak'ahs, two rak'ahs, two rak'ahs, two rak'ahs. And this is not permissible in Islam. The Prophet said, والسلام, it is not lawful to pray between Adhan and Iqamah or Fajr except two rak'ah, which is the Sunnah. Only. You should not, you must not add to that. So the man came to this boy and said, my nephew, my friend, it is not allowed for you to pray more than two rak'ahs because the Prophet has self forbade from this. So the man used the same methodology of Satan, you know, logic. Come on, Ay, Abu Muhammad, do you think I'm going to pray to Allah 
and Allah is going to punish me? Look at this weird way of thinking. So Sa'id ibn Sayyid, may Allah have mercy on his soul, said, My friend, Allah will not punish you for praying. Allah for, will punish you for going against the Sunnah. Yeah, now you're defying the Prophet's instruction, instructions, alayhi It's like someone coming and saying, I'm going to pray in the toilet. Why? You're not allowed to pray in the toilet. So, do you think Allah is going to punish me for praying? Allah is going to punish you for defying, doing it the wrong way. So ghulu, which is extreme, is likewise. The Prophet, alayhi <coughs> instructed us to be uh, uh, smiling to the Muslims. And he said that this is a charity. He comes to me and says, okay, now I'm strong in faith and belief. I meet the brother and he says, Assalamu alaikum. And I say, I look at him and say, oh, the thobes are below his ankles. <laughs> I turn uh, away and, what's happening, bro? Assalamu alaikum. Yeah. Good day to you too. So he comes to me and say, ah, oh, this is not a Muslim. So I start labeling people. I say, okay, what's the length of his beard? I've got a ruler. <laughs> Let me check. Does he have a miswak? I have a miswak. I've, I'm, I'm, I'm fully equipped, by the way. I have a miswak. I've got a short thob. i got the beard. And I'm ready. So shaitan comes from this door, from ghulu. Some people, and I've seen this, hit their mothers. Wallahi, a man came to me. I don't have to swear. But he came to me in my masjid in Saudi Arabia. And he said, Sheikh, and he started crying. And the guy was about 57 years old. He's old. <coughs> and he started crying and said, weeping and after Salah on one to one. I said, well, what's wrong? He said, my mother is so abusive. My father died five years ago and we were at the top of that village. And he was so generous, so kind, and my mother was so abusive. When he died, she started abusing everyone in the village. Cursing, backbiting, and doing all evil acts. And she was like 80 years old. So at least you could give her the benefit of the doubt that she's lost it up there. But still, and he said to the extent that we tried to apologize from everyone, we tried to do this and try, try to do that, and I tried to give her nasiha. My mother, you shouldn't do this. And she started talking about, bad about everyone else. And she talked about my father. And without knowing, I slapped her in the face. And the guy was crying like a baby, 57 years old. And he wanted to say, me to say, oh, it's okay, Allah will forgive you. I says, no, what you've done is a great and serious thing. He said, but she abused everybody else. She gave a bad reputation for my father. Said, this does not allow you to do one single bad act your mom. This is your mother. You cannot even raise your voice to your mother in Islam, even if she was a kafir. You are not allowed to raise your voice. <coughs> Al Hussein ibn Ali, Al Hussein ibn Ali, ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once was in one side of the house, and his mother was in another side of the house, and she said, Hussein, she called his, her, her son, and he said, yes, and she called again, she did not hear him. He said, yes, mother. And he felt bad about it. He said, I raised my voice, not out of arrogance, but I wanted her to hear me. And he freed two or three slaves for the sake of Allah, just to compensate for what he felt was a sin. Nowadays, my mom comes and say, go get the groceries from the car. Why me? Why not him? He's playing all the time. You always pick on me. Why? And you start talking about badly to your mom. I've seen so many kids talking bad things, doing bad things to their mothers, and they have no excuse. This is part of the hulu from both sides. So I hope this answers your question. Wrap it up. صلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله النبي محمد and I, and, and I thank you and I'm grateful to you for uh, uh, bearing with me I know it's cold outside so here it's just a good place to be but inshallah may Allah Azza wa Jal grant us the opportunity to rejoin and have the same meeting in paradise with our Prophet alayhi salatu wassalam wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh
شاطئ في يديه كفارة للخطايا وشاطئ في يديه كفارة للخطايا ذهبت يوما إليه بأدمعي وشقايا ورحت ألقي عليه تبتلي وهدايا يا